Hello! So I promised a video on Simon Mary Cohen, and I've realized it's gonna be a series of videos because I have a lot to say about the man. So, today we're just gonna tackle empathy and Simon Baron Cohen. In particular, this is a point of interest because Simon Baron Cohen developed the empathy quotient, which is used in part to help diagnose someone with autism. Um, it is a interesting measure and we're gonna talk about it a little bit. I'm gonna try to figure out how to show you on this screen um, what I did to code the empathy quotient. So I, t I, I broke it down and we're gonna get there. But we should step back a minute. So, there are three steps to empathy. Not many people know this, but Simon Baron Cohen does know this. This is, it's not in this three-step format, but there are different components to empathy which he does discuss in his papers which are cited below. So, step one, you have to know what someone's feeling. You have to understand what someone's feeling. If, you, if you're just completely oblivious, you can't empathize with them. Secondly, uh, there's feeling what someone's feeling, which is also known as affective empathy. So if someone's crying, you're gonna feel sad. That is generally what we in colloquial layman's terms, what we mean when we say empathy. We're talking about affective empathy. And third step is caring what someone feels. So this is also known as cognitive empathy or compassion, um, which is a bit two different things. So, so there are two different ways to care about what someone feels. There's cognitive empathy in which you say, okay, this person is feeling sad, and I understand like that that is unfortunate, and that I should do what I can to alleviate their suffering. There's compassion, which is more of the side of you are sad, and I feel more of an intuitive feeling-oriented <laughs> um, motivation that, oh, you're sad, I should, I just should help you feel better, and whatnot. Note that this is distinct from the I feel what you feel. There's I know what you feel, I feel what you feel, and I care what you feel. Notably, the first component is of course the most important. You have to know what someone's feeling in order to empathize with them, but once you've got that down, Honestly, we, we focus so much on affective empathy, but really it's the caring what someone feels. It's the cognitive empathy or compassion that actually results in someone behaving in a pro-social manner or an altruistic manner. Just feeling what someone else feels isn't enough to make you a good person if we're not going into ethics here. Because, for example, just, just think about it. If seeing someone be really sad makes you really sad, but you don't really care, like, you don't have that step of like, oh, I should do something, I should make them feel less sad. You just feel sad when you're around sad people. You just avoid sad people. Like, yeah, it's, <laughs> there are there are individuals who have that problem of they, they have perhaps too much affective empathy, and they cannot emotionally handle being around people in distress, and it results in them um, not being able to emotionally support people. Now, compassion is slightly less detached than cognitive empathy, but personally, I'd, I'd much, if I'm in distress, I'd much rather have someone that's like, kind of detached so that they can stay calm and kind of help me work through whatever I'm dealing with, um, rather than have someone who's like, oh man, that's, that's a bummer, I'm, I'm really getting distressed myself now, like, that's not helping the situation. So those are the three steps to empathy as we know it. 
And so, autistic people are not great at performing empathy in the ways that neurotypical people do. We actually do quite frequently have very significant affective empathy or and or cognitive empathy. We just very frequently get tripped up at step one. <laughs> because being able to understand what someone's really feeling, being able to perhaps if someone's not totally being open about what they're feeling, like seeing past that and understanding that like there's something deeper going on and reading the body language and the nonverbal sig it's hard. And a lot of autistic people just can't get to the point, like unless someone is openly sobbing, they can't get to the point of, uh, oh, I can understand that you're distressed. Um, and so it, because of that, Autistic people often don't perform empathy in ways that are socially acceptable. Someone might be upset, and an autistic person might seem totally callous, but they actually just don't understand that the person is upset. Um, or perhaps the person is upset, and the other person is trying to help them, and trying to make them feel better, and is just really bad at it. <laughs> like, they're just so socially awkward that it just doesn't go well. Um, that's happened to me a couple of times, but I got better. I learned. Um, so, with all of this, this is, this is our understanding of empathy here. Simon Baron Cohen developed a measure known as the empathy quotient in order to, in order to kind of measure how much someone feels empathy and performs empathy in a socially standard measure. And autistic people tend to do very poorly on this measure. Um, or at the very least get very low scores. Uh, and men get kind of in the middle and then women tend to get the highest scores. And this ties into Simon Baron Cohen's extreme male brain theory. That's a lot to go into, we're going to talk about more in the next video, but we're going to talk about it a bit right now. So Simon Marin Cohen has a lot of different measures that he likes to base his theory on. For now, we're just going to look at the empathy quotient. And in particular, we're going to look at, is this really measuring empathy? And as far as the extreme mere brain theory goes, what are some confounds in this measure that might significantly alter the results and and result in some gender differences and autism differences that would make it seem like extreme male brain theory but it's not necessarily so i'm gonna try to figure out how to overlay the screen thing with what i'm saying if i can't figure it out i'm not a technological wizard um then i will put photos of it. Can I put photos in the description? The very least I'll put links to photos in the description of of what I've done. So hopefully as you can see uh, there are 60 items on the empathy quotient. 20 of these are unscored. Unscored items. And of the 40 that remain um, I didn't count it up, but probably about 20 of them are reverse scored, meaning, um, you know, it's, if you agree with it, that means you're low on empathy, versus if you agree with it, that means you're high on empathy. I have cut out all of the unscored items. I've, I've deleted them from the list, and, and this, this, um, measure is available online for free. Thank you, okay, one one solid good thing about Simon Baron Cohen, all of his measures and pretty much all of his papers I found online free no paywall, so like, respect. That is that is one thing that I really appreciate. Thank you, Simon Baron Cohen. Anyway, of the 40 items that are scored, I found quite a few that Okay, I color-coded it. 
I color coded in pink. Yeah, I know I'm being stereotypical here, but I color coded in pink the ones that may be influenced by social desirability characteristics of women. What that means is social desirability characteristics are things where you, you ask someone a question and because they want to look good, they will answer in a way that is not entirely reflective of reality, though may entirely be an honest response because they, they, they think that's the truth because they want to believe that's the truth and they have high self-esteem. So for women, some things like adhering to social desire, like social norms for women may result in them changing their score. So for example, uh, item number six, I really enjoy caring for other people women are probably more likely to, to answer, yeah, I, I, I do, because, you know, our society really wants women to be caring. Uh, so all of those are in, are in pink. Social desirability characteristics for men I have put in blue. So, for example, item 39, I am able to make decisions without being influenced by people's feelings. I feel like men more than women may feel a social pressure to respond yes to that. Women might feel more okay being like, yeah, I mean, I care about people's feelings, but men would be like, I am objective. Um, and so that, that can be a real problem when you're designing a measure because people want to look good. And not only do they want to look good, just like, Intent, like intentionally like scooching it a little so you look better, but also just subconsciously adapting their self-identity to cultural norms. So, in green, I have things that might be influenced by socialization of genders. So, item number 18. When I was a child, I enjoyed cutting up worms to see what would happen. I think about the way young boys and young girls are generally raised, and I feel like it makes sense that men would ad would agree to that statement more than women. Because I can't... Th I, I would be very surprised if it would be more common for girls to be just handed a knife and say, just go play in the dirt, <laughs> you know? Um, but I can see that definitely happening with young boys of like, yeah, go play in the dirt. You want a knife? Sure, go ahead. And if a boy is found cutting up worms to see what happens, they're like, oh, a little scientist. Or like, oh, it's a little, a little, uh, but like, whatever. If a girl does it, they're like, oh God, are you, are you sane? And are you a psychopath? Or are you having m mental issues? <laughs> like, there's a, there's a different response level. Um... And certainly this is, the the situations I'm presenting are hyperboles, they're hypotheticals. I'm not saying that every person grew up in this binary system. I'm saying that as a whole on average, there are differences and that those may influence measures on average. So, yellow. I highlighted in yellow things that are there 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 were several items that seemed that they were basically just I am rude sometimes and I don't understand why people get upset. Um <clears throat> for example, uh item number 21, it is hard for me to see why some things upset people so much. Item number 27. If I say something that someone else is offended by, I think that's their problem, not mine. Uh, number 29. I can't always see why someone should have felt offended by a remark. So I think this is influenced by gender in several ways. So first of all, there's the intense social pressure on women to not offend people, to, to not be, to not encroach on the piece of a conversation that if if you are being disruptive as a woman that's much more socially unacceptable than being disruptive as a man um in addition i think some of these may be related to and i'm not a man i can't i can't say this for sure this is me hypothesizing but i think of something like 
if I say something that someone else is offended by, I think that's their problem, not mine. And I think of some of these sexist remarks that men have made on record. And they say things that are offensive to women, and then they don't understand when women get upset. Like, oh, we can't even compliment you? Like, why are you offended by that? Um, and so that, that kind of cultural thing around sexism might influence it a bit, but I think, I think more than that, the socialization of women to avoid offending people and avoid being rude may influence some bias in there. Finally, in gray, I highlighted in gray ones where I'm like, I feel, I feel like there's a bias in here and I have some basis for it, but like, it's so iffy that I'm like, eh. Like, number four, I find it difficult to explain to others things that I understand easily when they don't understand it the first time. And since I'm reading this looking for gender bias, I immediately think of mansplaining, but then, um, Number 19, I can pick up quickly if someone says one thing but means another. And I think of, like, the sitcoms of men complaining, like, Oh, my wife says one thing, but she means another. Why can't she just say what she means, you know? And that's, like, that's, that is a cultural trope. But at the same time, is it actually influent? Is it actually biasing the measure? I don't know. Like, the, these are my, ex like, kind of fringe extrapolations here. And I'm putting them in gray because I'm, like, just a disclaimer, I don't actually, I'm not making a firm claim on this one. To be fair, the others also, I'm like, there, there are levels, different, different levels for things. So, um, like, social desirability of, of women, um, number 57, I don't consciously work out the rules of social situations, is probably less influenced by social desirability characteristics for women then number six, I really enjoy caring for other people. So there's there's levels, but I put in gray anything where I'm like, I'm really not sure, but this is what I think. So there are 40 items that are scored. And I did all of my color coding, and there were a couple of items that I found that I did not color code with any of those. So for example, um, I often find it difficult to judge if something is rude or polite. Like, yeah, that's just not being good in social situations. Um, it might be related to empathy because it might get at that concept of I know what you're feeling. Um, number 11, it doesn't bother me too much if I'm late meeting a friend. That really depends on who, who your friends are and what your culture is. So like in America, we have a thing about being late, but like in other places, it's, it's pretty it's okay to be late, it's pretty chill. Um, and if someone is late to meeting me, I I should hope they feel bothered by it and, and feel upset by it because I'm very neurotic about being on time to everything. Um, but I know some friends who are unlikely to be even ready to go. Like if I show up at their house on time, they're not gonna be ready to go. Um, so it really, it really depends on that one. That one just makes me, is, is this empathy? Is it really empathy? Is that what it's getting at? Anyway. Um, another one, like, uh, if I see a stranger in a group, I think that it is up to them to make an effort to join in. That one's also kind of like, I mean, when I see a stranger in a group, I'm like, if they just want to sit on the outside and watch, like, if that is what they're comfortable doing, like, they should be allowed to- I'm not gonna force them into this conversation, um, and make them uncomfortable. Uh, so I think it is their decision to join if they want to. But that's me. Um, and then some are, like, number 60. I can usually appreciate the other points, person's point of view, even if I don't agree with it. That's just social desirability characteristics for everyone, like genderless, like everyone's gonna want to say, yeah, I'm an understanding person. I, I appreciate points of view that aren't my own. That's a statement I want to agree with. Like, you know, it doesn't matter gender wise on that one. But at the same time, I'm like, is that really empathy? Like, 
I mean, basic decency and respect, yeah, but like, empathy? I, d I don't know. So, of the 40 scored items, there were, hold on, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There were seven that I did not highlight with something. Two were highlighted in gray. So at most nine items that I think are pretty unbiased and aren't gonna have any gender results that happen because of, you know, society and not innate differences. And if you're really interested in learning more about society and innate differences and how does that all work, um, I highly recommend Cordelia Fine's book, uh, Delusions of Gender. She also has a second book, um, Testosterone Rex. Very good one. Um, and I will be talking about some of the things covered in those books, uh, in future videos. Uh, particularly my summary of extreme male brain theory. I was gonna mention that a lot. Um, and I just highly recommend checking it out in general because it's extremely good. Um, but on the topic of empathy, I think that a measure should have more unbiased, more clearly unbiased items, and perhaps maybe account for the bias in some way, or try to address it, um, and there's also some, some significant evidence indicating that if you tell someone, we're measure, we're, this is a, this is a test of your, your empathy, that women are gonna do better and men are gonna do worse, than if you say, like, this is a test of your, uh, social cognition. You know, like, when, when you prime someone to think the measure is evaluating empathy, then it will result in them in some sex differences. Uh, that, that effect is called priming, and the discussion of how it affects empathy measures in particular is in Cordelia Fine's book. Um, excuse me. I will try to find the page for that and include it in the citation. Um, and I think that's about it. The empathy quotient is deeply flawed. The gender differences that it has are not necessarily due to genuine differences in people's male or female brains. And autistic people do feel empathy. And they can be very empathetic. And the difficulties that they encounter in performing empathy in a socially normative way are not indicative of a lack of empathy. Um, most of all, they're indicative of a lack of functioning social cognition, but we're going to talk about in another video eventually about how the social signals of autistic people and neurotypical people differ such that autistic people may be able to read autistic people's signals better than they read neurotypical people's signals. But that's a video for another time. Uh, and for now, this is all I have on empathy. Please let me know what you think in the comments below. And uh, especially if you're autistic, I'd love to hear what you think. Um, and that's all. Thank you.